Hello. Last time, I talked about Forty Cores, and how their terrible fortunes and choice in business partners caused a very swift, hard downfall. Today's subject fell even harder. This team had a knee-jerk change in regulations, a tragic death, and a massive earthquake thrown in their face, and they had to find a way to survive. While other new hopefuls before and since found themselves on the wrong side of Lady Luck, in the case of Simtech Grand Prix, so much went so wrong so fast that I would argue that it was fate. We can't talk about simulation technology research without first bringing up its leading voice, Nick Wirth, mechanical engineering graduate from University College London and the youngest member of the Royal Institution of Mechanical Engineers. In his time at UCL, he made friends with Mark Hurd, son of March co-founder Robin Hurd, and Robin saw so much potential in Nick as the next big name in car design, he hired him as an aerodynamicist, working under chief designer Gordon Kopic. He graduated from UCL on Tuesday, and was working for March by Thursday. Worth was a helping hand to the king of car design, Adrian Newey, in designing March's 1988 Formula One car, the March 881, while also being the head of their Le Mans project in collaboration with Nissan, building the R87E. Ligier had offered him the job of technical director in 1989, but he turned it down, opting to stay at March. His decision to stay at March would not last all that long, as when Leighton House took over, he, alongside Max Mosley, backed out. Mosley was interested in creating a cost-effective racing research and development company, and, on Hurd's recommendation, Mosley and Worth founded Simtech. The company was originally founded and run out of Nick Worth's house, with only one other guy on the payroll, but the company rapidly expanded to the point where they could build a new base of operations in an industrial estate in Banbury. Due to Mosley's connections, Simtech had done work all across the racing world, doing R&D work for teams in IndyCar, Group C Endurance, F3000, and even had the FIA and French government on their list of names served, as they had built Ligier's new wind tunnel in Magnicourt. Above all else, though, they had been working in secret with BMW for a prospective Formula One bid. They handle the chassis in Banbury, and the BMW deals with the engines back in Munich. Unfortunately, BMW pulled out of the deal and decided to run the 3 Series in DTM. Max Mosley left the team in 1992 as he was elected president of the FIA. He sold all of his shares in Simtech to Worth, who now owned the company outright. They still had those chassis they had built for BMW laying around, but thankfully, someone came along to buy them. Andrea Sassetti, owner of the Andrea Moda team. The cars he had attempted to run in the 1992 season were illegal since they had been used before by a previous team, Coloni, the team that he had bought up. He needed all new cars, so he bought the two unused BMW cars, and then proceeded to have the funniest F1 journey in the history of the sport. Because the team's administration was so incompetent, nobody suspected that the car was the issue. And they were right to not assume that. In an interview with Motorsport Magazine, the great Roberto Moreno lauded the Simtech S921 as a fine piece of machinery that was arguably being mistreated. In 1993, Simtech was tapped to build a car for the upstart Bravo GP team, but that venture was also abandoned because their main investor passed away after a brief battle with cancer. At this point, Worth had the realization that he could only get his cars into an F1 race if he just did it himself, so in August of 1993, he announced he would be forming his own Formula One team, Simtech Grand Prix. His first big shareholder in this new venture was Formula One legend Sir Jack Brabham, and as such, he hired his son David to drive one of the two cars. While his efforts with the Brabham team didn't go too well in 1992, David had talent, having won the British Formula Three Championship and Macau Grand Prix in 1989. Through Brabham, Simtech got a deal with Ford to supply some V8 engines, and he paid the $500,000 entry fee out of his own pocket. Yes, the, the entry fee back in the mid-90s was only half a million dollars instead of the, what, $200 million it is now? Simtech originally wanted to use the car they had built for Bravo, which featured an active suspension system, but Max Mosley had hastily banned all driver aids for the 1994 season, so Worth had to go back to the drawing board. What he came up with was the Simtech S941, 
a conservative design that was about as overweight as your mother, <laughs> which was being powered by an engine that was outdated and underpowered compared to what the likes of Ferrari and McLaren were running. At least the car was safe, which is more than what life racing engines can say. There were a couple names floated around for who would drive the second car alongside David Brabham. Andrea de Cesaris was rumored, but that was seen as too much of a risk, considering his penchant for incredible accidents. Gil de Farin was considered, but he took his money overseas to America. Jean-Marc Gounon, formerly of Minardi, was also contacted, but he had other commitments. They finally decided on Austrian rookie Roland Ratzenberger. After cutting his teeth for years in what is now Japanese Super Formula, he finally got himself into an F1 drive at the age of 33, his second attempt after a ride with Jordan failed to materialize in 1991. Fun fact, with David Brabham age 29 and Roland Ratzenberger age 33, Nick Wirth was actually younger than his two drivers, as he was only 27. If I can give Simtech one thing though, they got one of the coolest title sponsors in racing history, MTV. As part of their deal, they aired exclusive interviews and other things around the paddock that the average fan wouldn't be able to see, presented by future game show presenter Davina McCall. What they did may seem rudimentary now, but back then this was revolutionary stuff, and damn is it so cool to look back on. Despite the backing from MTV, it was clear that 1994 would be a rough year. The car was slow, to put it bluntly, the team itself had less staff than a Lowe's, and there was just barely enough money to make it through the year. At the team's first race at Interlagos, Brabham would qualify dead last, 5.2 seconds behind pole, while Ratzenberger would miss the race entirely, being a second and a half behind that. Brabham would finish the race in 12th, last among the cars that finished, and four laps down on eventual winner Michael Schumacher. At the Pacific Grand Prix in Okayama, Brabham and Ratzenberger would take the final two grid slots, snubbing the Pacifics of Bertrand Gasho and Paul Belmondo. Despite being one of the only drivers in the field with experience on the track, having run it before in Japanese Formula 3000, he only made the grid by a half a second. To add on to the insanity of 90s F1, Ratzenberger was 6.3 seconds down on pole. In the age of the 107% rule, he would have missed the grid by a full second and a half. Brabham would retire from the race two laps in with electrical issues, but Ratzenberger powered on to finish in P11, again, last of the finishers, and now five laps down. The production was just as slow as expected, but the team was sorta of improving week to week. There's a silver lining to every cloud and all that jazz. But then, we move on to the third race of the year, the San Marino Grand Prix. Roland Ratzenberger was killed in an accident during qualifying. On his outlap, he went off course and damaged his front wing at Aqua Minerale, and on his flying lap, it broke as he was driving through the Villeneuve kink, and he smashed into a concrete wall at 195 miles an hour. He was killed instantly. His cause of death was attributed to a basilar skull fracture, the injury that had earlier killed drivers such as Jovi Marcello, J.D. McDuffie, and Neil Bonnet, and would later take the lives of Adam Petty, Kenny Irwin Jr., Gonzalo Rodriguez, and Dale Earnhardt. Ratzenberger was the first fatality in F1 since 1986 when Elio De Angelis died in a testing accident, and the first at a race weekend since 1982, when Ricardo Poletti was killed in an accident at the start of the Canadian Grand Prix. Instead of withdrawing from the event, as was tradition, Brabham made the decision to carry on in Roland's memory. Earlier, Ratzenberger had set a time that was good enough to start in 26th, and his position on the grid was left empty. Paul Belmondo was offered to start in that grid slot, but he declined, as he didn't think that he deserved it. Unfortunately, Ratzenberger's accident would not be the extent of the carnage, as Iron Senna was also killed at Emola that weekend. Simtech would run with just Brabham for the following Grand Prix at Monaco, but the team would take another punch to the gut that didn't even concern the team. Sauber's Carl Wendlinger would wreck hard at the Nouvelle Chicane, suffering a rumored 360 Gs, the highest amount of force anyone has ever survived. He was placed into a coma for 19 days. Most of Simtech's engineers and mechanics had worked with Wendlinger in their time together in March, so morale took another blow. Andrea Montermini would replace the fallen Ratzenberger, 
but his time in the seat wouldn't last long, as during practice for the following Spanish Grand Prix, he would have an accident in the final corner and tear up his foot, putting him out for the remainder of the year. They ran with one car again at Montreal, as they needed to build another chassis and deal with their skyrocketing repair bills. Brabham would finish 14th, hopefully signaling the end of this run of cruel, cruel fate. Better news would come to lighten the mood, as Jean-Marc Gounon, who they had looked at to drive the car preseason, was finally free, and he joined the team for the French Grand Prix. While Gounon would rarely out-qualify Brabham, he was a reliable hand that could bring the car home in one piece. He gave the team its joint best finish of ninth in his debut with the team at the aforementioned French GP. While all of the attention was on Damon Hill and his efforts to pull Williams up by their bootstraps in the wake of Senna's death, Autosport Magazine was calling David Brabham the hero of the season in his efforts to propel the team forward post Roland. Despite his car's myriad of issues, he would drag that car forward by any means necessary, competing with the likes of Lotus and LaRousse, and occasionally beating them. His crowning achievement over the year, in my mind, is out-qualifying Eric Comas at Belgium, right after Comas said that he would retire if a Simtech ever went faster than him. <laughs> Lol. After JMG left, Simtech acquired the services of Italian sports car prospect Domenico Sciatarella, the man with one of the coolest helmet designs I have ever seen. While Mimo was by definition a pay driver, he was no Lavaggi or Delatraz. Like Gunon, his careful approach to driving brought the car home safe and sound more often than not. He finished 19th at the European Grand Prix, so naturally they replaced him with your favorite driver's favorite driver, Taki Inoue, for Japan, but all he was good for was qualifying 4 seconds slower than Brabham and then tearing the car up early in the race. Mimo was brought back for the season finale, where he retired with gearbox issues. Brabham would end the season with a best finish of 10th at Catalonia, and it probably would have been 9th at Hockenheim, but he retired with 8 laps to go with a clutch problem. Gunon was technically classified 9th, DNFing after an engine failure 2 laps later. Mechanical unreliability was a theme of the team throughout the season, but on-track accidents were not. Brabham only had 2 accidents all year, both involving Jean Alesi, fun fact. 1994 was already a baptism by fire for Semtech, but the offseason before 1995 looked to make everything worse. The first blow was that MTV was looking to scale down its commitment to the team for 1995. Second was David Brabham's departure after BMW gave him an offer that he couldn't refuse to drive in the BTCC. Unfettered, Worth powered on, building the S951 and signing Mimo Shiatarella to drive for the first half of the season, while Hideki Noda, formerly of LaRousse, paid a deposit to drive for the second half. For the second car, they got a name that you would have never expected. Benetton loaned them Jos Verstappen, as in the eyes of Flavio Briatore, he needed experience. This was announced late in 1994, but then, in January of 1995, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake hit the city of Kobe in Japan, which affected Noda's sponsor. There were now doubts that Noda would even race for them and whether or not Simtech would get his money. It was obvious from the beginning that the S951 was a massive improvement over the previous year's design. Mimo could haul that thing to respectable finishes, regularly, be regularly beating the Pacific and 40 cars, but Verstappen made that car shine. With Yoss the boss at the wheel, Simtech would find themselves in the midfield at some points. At the Argentine Grand Prix, Yoss stuck it in P14 in qualifying, and he had found himself in the points after the first pit cycle, creating one of the most cursed visuals in F1 history. Jos Verstappen, in a Simtech, fighting Gerhard Berger's Ferrari for position on merit. Of course, the sunshine and rainbows couldn't last forever as they then had a slow pit stop, and since the car was as un still as unreliable as my water heater, the clutch died the next lap. Jos himself said that the car was very easy to drive, equating it to driving a go-kart. The team was still crumbling, though. They double DNF'd at Imola, but then finished 12th and 15th at Catalunya before they showed up to Monaco. There, Worth announced the team was £6 million in debt, which looked to be getting even worse as no sponsors were showing up. One sponsor they had talked to previously turned out to be a con man that gave them nothing. 
neither of the gearboxes they brought to Monaco worked properly. Verstappen clattered the wall twice in practice, and then both cars tapped out with clutch issues before the race had even started. This turned out to be Simtech's last appearance in Formula 1, as Worth shut down the team, leaving 48 people out of a job. To offset their debts, they auctioned off some of the things that they had run. Mimo's rolling chassis was sold for £16,000, and Verstappen's went for £18,000. Their hauler was sold for about £50,000 to a BTCC privateer, and their pit boards went for about £100. Overall, the auction only raised about £250,000, nowhere near enough to settle Worth's debts. Wow, that was... depressing. Now, what if fate dealt Simtech a better hand? Let's go back in time. Now. 1994's driver lineup gets a bit of a tweak. David Brabham is signed to drive one car, but the other is split 5-5-6 in three ways. Roland Ratzenberger to start the year, Jean-Marc Gounon in the middle, and Domenico Schiaterella to end the year. Yes, in this scenario, Ratzenberger survives Imola. Simtech ends the 1994 season with no points, although Brabham finishes a respectable 7th at Hockenheim, not undone by the clutch issue that put him out of the race in real life. While it would be cool, unfortunately, I don't think bringing Roland Ratzenberger back would have happened. At 33 years old when he made his first start, he was too old to be first breaking into Formula 1. Yes, I know, Damon Hill broke into F1 at 31 and became a world champion, but he's the exception and not the rule. If he were to become a mainstay in F1, the best thing that could have happened was getting that Jordan seat in 1991, or even better still, breaking through in the late 80s when he was in his mid-20s. Back on the Simtech front, in 1995, Simtech gets a saving grace. Alongside the loan of Jos Verstappen, Simtech enters a technical partnership with Benetton, offering more reliable gearboxes, new pit tech to get them in and out faster, and even better still, customer Renault engines. Verstappen scores 6 points with the new tech, including a miraculous 4th place finish at the Argentine Grand Prix, just beating out Gerhard Berger. As for the second car, there's a bit of an issue. While I would love to say that the Great Hanshin Earthquake never happens, I can't stop a catastrophic weather event, so instead of taking the money from Hideki Noda, Simtek bites the bullet and hires the man, the myth, the legend, Taki Inoue to drive for the second half of the season, replacing Mimo. Simtek buys out Verstappen's contract for 1996, and Domenico Schiaterella finally has enough sponsorship to last the full year, so finally, after two years, Simtek runs with a consistent driver lineup for the entire season. Their point total improves, and Mimo even scores a couple points, good enough to grab a mid-pack spot in the Constructors' Championship. Let's say... 6th. In this universe, Simtech survives and thrives as a Renault-powered team. I hope that raised the mood. Now let's move on to the credits. Nick Wirth would move on to be the chief designer for Benetton, do some work in the robotics field, help with the FIA in testing their abandoned split rear wing concept in 2008, before moving on to work with the upstart Virgin Racing Team, penning the VR01, the first car designed entirely with computational fluid dynamics and no wind tunnel testing. There's your useless bar trivia for today. While his BTCC career lasted only one lackluster year, David Brabham would forge a great career everywhere else, ending his career as a four-time 12 Hours of Sebring champion, a three-time, well, technically four-time, 24 Hours of Le Mans winner, once outright, and a two-time American Le Mans Series champion, and the winner of the 1997 Bathurst 1000. If there was an International Auto Racing Hall of Fame, David Brabham would surely be in it. Roland Ratzenberger's death was not in vain, as his and Senna's deaths sparked the refounding of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, an entity that still exists to this day, and soon after began a new push for safety. The Hans device, the safety equipment that surely would have saved his life, was made mandatory in 2003. Before his death, he was tapped by Toyota to drive in the 1994 24 Hours of Le Mans, alongside Mauro Martini and Jeff Krosnoff. Eddie Irvine took his spot after his passing, and the car that still carried his name ended up winning the LMP1 class, finishing second outright. 
Jean-Marc Gounon would run in sports cars after his time at Simtech, winning his class at the 1997 24 Hours of Le Mans alongside Pierre-Henri Raffanel and Anders Olofsson. His son Jules has forged an even brighter sports car career as a three-time winner of the Bathurst 12 Hour and multi-time race winner in IMSA. Domenico Sciatarella has done a little bit of everything after his F1 career ended. He did a few starts in kart, raced in the FIA GT Championship, and even raced in the Will and Euro NASCAR series. He made two starts at Valencia in 2015, with a best finish of 6th place. Hideki Noda moved on to kart after Simtech collapsed, winning the Grand Prix of Portland in 1997 in a ride with Indy Regency Racing. He made six starts in, on the other side of the aisle, with a best finish of 10th at Phoenix in 2002. He spent the next few years of his career in Super GT and Formula Nippon before retiring. His daughter Juju is currently competing in Super Formula. Jos Verstappen would bounce around the grid for a while, driving for Arrows, Tyrrell, Stewart, and Minardi before leaving F1 after 2003. He recorded one win in the A1GP series representing the Netherlands, and won the LMP2 class at Le Mans in 2008. He's still somewhat active today, last doing rally competitions in 2022. His son Max is currently making Formula 1 an absolute bore to watch. And so that marks the end of the story of Simtech Grand Prix. They started it with good intentions, but you know what they say, the road to hell is paved with those. Fate gave them the shaft at every possible corner. I have been Bobcat205, and thank you for watching. Tune in next time for the final historical piece of this little mini-series, the story of Pacific Racing. See you next time.